I have several investors. I've got five. Three of them don't respond to my messages, but I, I kind of assume that might happen. The other two are very responsive. And with both of them, one of them I've known for seven years. So I knew him for years before he invested. The other one, I met him for the purpose of investing. And we talked for about two years before he finally invested because we weren't ready when we first started talking. And my thought process with them is I should be as honest with them as I am with my team and my parents and basically anyone that I have a relationship with. It's always blunt honesty. I refuse to like withhold any any of the truth from anybody. That's actually, an, if you want psychology, I'm sorry that I'm, that I'm cutting you off, but there is there is honesty and there is integrity, okay? And, and integ integrity is actually above honesty. And it, I can give you an example if, if you want um, a, a clear example on why this is true. So you can picture yourself, you can picture um, a mother walking with, uh, with two of her daughters and let's say in the middle of a, of a war and, and the soldier comes in and tells her, listen, if these two girls are yours, I'm going to kill you one. But if one of them is a, is a friend of yours, then you can just go. And then the, the instinct would be, ah, this is mine. This is my friend's. And she can go. She wasn't honest. So this is an interview with Rom Lacritz. We did an episode previously, number 96, where we talked about the four stages of a company. So if you haven't watched that yet, definitely go for it. It's on YouTube. And today we're going to be talking a little bit more about your psychology with how you started companies, run companies, how you think about yourself and, and how you've evolved through all of that. So why don't you tell everyone just a little bit about yourself in case they haven't seen number 96 yet. And that way uh, we can go from there. First of all, I encourage everyone to go to... Uh, um... Uh, chapter 96 and, and, and hear uh, the basis of, of building a startup. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for over 10 years. Uh, I've done a, a, a few companies. I, uh, I got the, the chance to uh, be acquired uh, for one of these companies. I took a company public to the main market to the London Stock Exchange and I also have another uh, company running today. Uh, each one in a different industry in a, in a different role. So I've seen a lot and have a, a, a lot of angles on this journey and I'm happy to participate. All right. Thank you very much. So your current business is Anchor? Exactly. So today I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of Anchor. Anchor is automating billing and collection for small businesses. Um, you know, hassle-free on-time payments, just like software gets paid. Um, that's actually one of the uh, types of pitches that, that we have. I'm also at, on the board of a company called Omnix, developing new antibiotics against resistant bacteria, which I founded with my partners in uh, 2013. Okay, so what made you want to be an entrepreneur? So, so this, this uh, episode, if I'll take it seriously, is something that if you'll take an entrepreneur throughout his journey, changes every I'll say a couple of periods, a um, couple of years, a couple of months, you learn things every day. I was born to be an entrepreneur, uh, I guess. I, I opened my first business when I was uh, 12, 12 years old. I bought flowers, um, made them into bouquets and sent friends to sell them uh, uh, across the, the town I was growing up. And then I did something very similar with uh, babysitting. I, I moved house to house. I found the houses that, um, you know, parents that want babysitting. And then I brought girlfriends of mine to do that babysitting when I was uh, 14 and then I've done parties and um, always tried to solve problems and um, and um, um, build things so I I don't know if it was a decision or something that just you know drives me towards like like a uh, um, someone that surfs waves or someone that wants to manage a lot of people. Um, each one feels his calling in a, in a different way. Is anyone in your family an entrepreneur? That may have been like a reason how you kind of saw, oh, this is something that we can do. Um, so both of my brothers are entrepreneurs, each one with his own uh, project. Uh, my father was actually in the uh, um, military for a long time, and uh, but he has the entrepreneurial spirit um, and, and also uh, my mother. But I guess that everybody knows that in Israel, uh, being an entrepreneur is a, you know, is, is a common denominator. and. Um, and that's just the way like we, we, we live in the culture here and it grows in the army and throughout our life's journey. So of all of the businesses you've done so far, which one have you been the most excited about and why? So, um, okay, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it's a good question. Um, I think that the, um, the company that I'm most excited about is, is Anchor. Um, it's solving a pain that I had um, as as a as a business owner, um, and I really see the the 
amount of value that we can bring to people and and really help and, and make a dent on how um, people do business. So if the first pitch is, you know, let them pay just like they pay the software. The second is that there were three generations of documents. There was document 1.0, that's paper. Document 2.0, that's DocuSign. The, the, the document is, um, is digital, but document 3.0 is Anchor. It's a, an actual online document. It's not really a document. And then once you do that, that, that um, online agreement, it's live, it's amendable, it can be automatic, and you can derive so much value out of it that, um, that the potential is it's just, it's, it's just enormous. Um, I will say that the second runner-up is, is Omnix, where, where we're you know, saving lives and uh, actually tackling um, um, resistant bacteria that today kills 50% of the people that um, it touches. It has 100% resistance. So, so it's, a, it's a hard fight. <laughs> Well, it would make sense that the things you're most passionate about are the things that you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's also true. If, if we want to sell, if we want to talk uh, psychology. So normally in these interviews, I ask people to mention what their current revenue is from the company that they're running. In your case, I feel like I don't need to ask that because you have a company that's gone public and you've sold a few companies. So I'm sure that they've done over a million dollars a year in revenue in order to be capable of doing that. Um, is Anchor at a point where it's already crossed a million dollars a year in revenue? No, so we not yet. We're on the way. Um, we're still, um, not still, but we're building it in a way that um, that's more mature then uh then i don't know first time or second time we want to build this cookie cutter uh from day one and not you know reach a million dollars and then raise more funds in order to build the, the the cookie cutter and the repeatable business we're trying to do it from the beginning um so we're concentrating not only on on reaching the 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 million dollar mark but also building it in such a way that it will explode exponentially once we get there and it'll be part of the explosion and not prior to the explosion. You mentioned raising more money. So did you already get outside investment for this company? For Anchor? Yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, for Anchor, we raised $15 million up to date. I'll, I'll, I've spoken to a number of entrepreneurs who always insist on bootstrapping their businesses, but I also hear of investors, uh, I also hear entrepreneurs that say, why put my own money into it when I can get other people to put their money in and I can just spend their money to grow the company? What was your thought process for that okay. for Anchor? Because I, I have people that refuse investor money and I have people who like investor money. So I'm curious where your head is there. Okay, so so it's it's really um, it's really a strategic uh, question. Um, I think that what we're trying to do here is super big, um, but it's based a lot of on, on common sense and and you know uh, knowledge that you um that we uh, understood from the past couple of years for me when we started anchor i funded the company for the per past uh, for the first i guess 12 to 18 months uh before we raised funds it was really important for me to know that we're touching on a real problem that the solution works that we can get clients and we reached our first um dozen clients um bootstrap once we did that and we and we learned more, the only way to expedite it uh, and, and move faster in, in a market that moves super fast like fintech is is raise, is raise funds and, and a lot of it. It has a lot of um, advantages and a lot of disadvantages. There are a lot of things that after you raise funds, you deal with and need to work not only specifically with investors and, and uh, uh, maintaining the relationship, but um, growing fast has its challenges. Uh, recruiting fast has its challenges and and it does add a lot of um, friction to the process uh, in comparison to going uh, uh, bootstrap uh, in what we're doing in anchor um, it would have taken us i don't know five years to get to the point where we're at now and it and it wasn't worth it um, in my head though my next company would be bootstrapped and um and we'll take it all the way uh, bootstrap. Do you mind saying how much you spent on Anchor before you decided to raise funds and how many employees you have now? And after that, speak to the challenges of investors and growing fast and all that. So before we raised funds, I probably invested um, somewhere around $100,000, um, give or take, on, on travel and design and building the product and infrastructure. And, Stuff like that. We were uh, three partners, uh, so it's not including 
you know, three salaries. That's that's another muscle menace with with the level of people another million dollars, um, which was invested just in time. And uh, and if you look at most startups um, from the idea in in the regular um, um, life, not not in uh, 2021, invest between um, I'll say six to 12 months from the moment they have an idea and start working until they find and find a partner and figure out what they're doing and being able to pitch it and talk to customers and and really build a company around it. So it's uh, it's not um. I don't think it was something special. We just wanted to take it maybe a bit further than than uh, than it's taken usually. We wanted to get to first clients without you know without funds. Um, in terms of work with with investors, so each investor is is a is a whole world, and um, and you need to maintain and you want to maintain a relationship. You wanna both learn from from his experience and you need to build trust uh, that starts um, with him saying, I'll invest in you and I believe in you. And then you need to uh, uh, believe in him. I, I I do believe and I do, I work with startups and I also make uh, investments today. And I do see um, a lot of entrepreneurs that look at that relationship as I need to sell something to the investors. I need to show them always that everything is, is good. And, and, and that's, it's, it's, I would say it's it's actually a small part of it, um, but it's actually, it's also each person and his personality and how you know how he builds relationships and how um, how he grows and um, you, you can learn a lot from from a, a professional investor and and of course and in investors like we have that were entrepreneurs in the past and and they've done tens if not hundreds of investments and they've seen this and they've seen this journey so many times they can really help you focus and um, just save time and and um, and failures that is part of your life as an entrepreneur. Now, I have several investors. I've got five. Three of them don't respond to my messages, but I, I kind of assume that might happen. The other two are very responsive. And with both of them, one of them I've known for seven years. So I knew him for years before he invested. The other one... I met him for the purpose of investing and uh, we talked for about two years before he finally invested because we weren't ready when we first started talking. And my thought process with them is I should be as honest with them as I am with my team and my parents and basically anyone that I have a relationship with. It's always blunt honesty. I refuse to like withhold any, any of the truth from anybody. Um, that's actually, an, if you want it, psychology, I'm sorry that I'm that I'm cutting you off, but there is no go for it. There is honesty, and um, like the word uh, slipped out of my mind in Hebrew and in English. <coughs> It'll get back to me in a second. I'll, I'll take that. point. it's actually it's an you it's an interesting point. Um, ah, there is honesty and there is integrity. Okay. And, and integ okay. integrity is actually above honesty. And, <clears throat> and it, I can give you an example if, if you want um, a, a clear example on why this is true. So you can picture yourself, you can picture um, a mother walking with, uh, with two of her daughters and let's say in the middle of a, of a war and, and the soldier comes in and tells her, listen, if these two girls are yours, I'm going to kill you one. But if one of them is a, is a friend of yours, then you can just go. And then the, the instinct would be, ah, the, this is mine. This is my friend's. And she can go. She wasn't honest. So you're saying a woman has integrity. She tells the person, this is uh, not my child, et cetera. So, so, so it wasn't honest. Her daughter there, uh, she was just told that, you know, that she's not her daughter. But integrity-wise, she did the right thing. And when you build your integrity, um, you build it around your values, your own values. And, um, and then with your investors, you need to understand where, where your integrity is. Um, and it's the same with your team and it's the same with, with anyone you meet in your life. But it's not, it's not, I think that that's what you're saying as well, but it's not only honesty. It's, it's, you know, sometimes you, you, you get mad and you're mad at someone and honestly you hate him at that moment. 
but it's it, it doesn't matter five minutes after, so you just don't say it. It's, so that's another example of how integrity is is, um, is higher. I believe I maintain integrity, but I guess what I was trying to get at was if there's a problem, I won't hide it from them because they've given me money and it. I think it's fair for them to know. Even if it's something that we know how to solve, I think they should be aware of it, at least now in the early stages because we haven't launched yet. I think as we launch and we get users and things change, maybe it'll be slightly different where there's less that they need to hear about on a daily basis. But right now things are, you know, it, they're moving a little bit slower than they should and money's not coming in as fast as it should and things like that. I don't know. What do you it's think? That, as, as, things just take much, much more time than people think. It's, there is no should or, or, or could. Things take a, a lot of time. And what I do in these cases is there has to be a goal. There has to be some job to be done. There has to be a, a, a reason why, um, why you want to um, you know, do something. And it's the same thing with, with investors. If you want to, and, and I'm, I'm actually also open as a book and uh, integrity is super high and, and honesty as well. Um, but if, I don't know, We'll take Omnix. If there was an experiment that didn't work and you know the reason and a week later it works, I don't know if I see a real reason to, you know, hurt that relationship or make him make the, the investor um, more stressed out for something that, that that's not there. If we had a bug in, in Anchor, um, it's not the first thing I do is not call my, my investors and tell them I, I had a bug. I fix it. I understand what's, uh, you know, what's, what's happening. And if it's interesting or important, and uh, I think it may have long-term effects, then, then I will call and actually ask how, how they think I can solve it and how they can help me. So I'll have a goal in it. It's not, not just for the, you know, being honest. Yeah. I mean, I don't, Tell them all of that stuff. I get that. There's no reason for them to know, oh, we've got 300 bugs for this new feature. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, that, that's not helpful. Um, but I think because of the stage we're in, I think we need a little bit more support right now. But I think as we as we launch and get users, it'll be a different conversation, I think. Yeah. So I'm curious if you ever regretted starting any of your businesses. No, but that's I, I don't regret anything that, that I've done. Um, I learned throughout life that you can't really um, try to um, um, try to test if a if a decision was right or wrong after the fact. You have you have the information you have doing the the, the time that that you made a decision, and if things changed after a year or a year and a half, it doesn't matter. Um, with investments, with opening things, with I don't know, picking your your uh, uh, chosen one, with with whatever you you. You act with what with the knowledge you have at the same Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much, and we'll take you back to the show now. The same moment that you took the decision. So it's like clean and clear for me. Okay. Have you ever thought about stopping any of the businesses you'd ever started? Um, so uh, uh, my first startup, um, we had, um, it was a um, location-based service uh, back in 2012. Mm -hmm. And the whole location-based um, industry uh, actually collapsed. There was a, a big postmortem about it. And if you look today, you know, nobody really uses check-ins and Foursquare and events on Facebook. It's, it's not really a thing. Nobody really uh, connected between the real world and the social world in the location-based um, um, data because theoretically you have so much data of who goes where and what type of people and what they're doing and, and what hours it's full or not. And nobody, nobody really figured it out and used it. People are still trying. Um, so 
we got to a point that we had a few hundred of thousands of dollars in the bank account and um and we chose to uh to to stop and then there was a, a suggestion to take the, the technology and try to do the same thing like uh, in dating um similar to hum to bumble and uh and the tinder but actually with more information and 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 even uh, better and there was a, a discuss, discussions between my two partners and I and at the end of the day we chose we, we chose to back down and not uh, keep going because that's it was it didn't feel like that was our calling in life if we were talking about calling in the beginning of the uh, conversation fair enough I've I've stopped a few businesses because I just felt like it, it wasn't the right thing anymore. So I get it. It makes sense. What has been the hardest decision you've ever had to make related to any of your businesses? <clears throat> um, okay. So uh, I'll start with, with people. Sometimes you have to let people go. And um, in, generally, it's the hardest thing to to do always, I'm, um, I'm, I'm an optimist and I like to, to teach and I like to help people grow, but at some point um, you understand that it's, um, that it's not really all about you and that you can do anything. So letting people go um, is, is always hard, even when, even when you know it's the best thing for them as well, because um, they ca can't grow uh, with you anymore. Um, Another hard decision was um, was actually um, selling the company, um, and um, and you know, and, and giving your your baby away. Um, it had it, its benefits, uh, but it, but at the time we had a lot of discussions if it's uh, if it's the right decision or not, um, and uh, it it kept us from from sleeping a few nights. What was the hardest thing about selling that company for you? Um, that you, f I felt that we can do more and we can succeed more, and 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 you know, and we we were just getting started. The company was three years old. Um, it, the, the feeling is that we just got started and and uh, can can take this journey more. So what was what what happened in that discussion that kind of allowed you to accept it? Um, what happened is that. Um, we actually said no uh, the first time, and they came back with and uh, pretty much tripled the the amount. And then you're like, okay, that's like economically, no matter how you look at it, it's it's uh, it's a, it's it's an it's an amazing deal. So, you know, it's it, it was a um, you, you couldn't really say say no. It was, but it was hard because you know it, um, all of the uh, reasons I just um described did you think about saying no again to see if they would increase it one more time <laughs> no, no 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 but i can tell you that with a different company we also got an offer um and we signed the term sheet and we kept going and at some point uh we did the economics and and we backed down um while we were uh, advancing to uh definitive agreements we decided not to sell the company and it still exists was there a penalty? Like, so for example, Elon Musk had a, an agreement for a billion dollars if he backed out and now they're suing him and they're trying to get him to go through with it. Did you have to pay a fee for backing out? No, 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 it wasn't that big of a, okay. of, of a deal. Okay. Well, I mean, even if it was like a hundred thousand, something that like, you yeah. know, to, to pay for their lawyer's fees or anything like that. Okay. What has been your most expensive mistake? My most expensive. And how much was it? <laughs> my most expensive mistake was um, so privately. So it was not selling uh, shares in in one of my companies when I could, and I lost somewhere around three million dollars. <laughs> mm. so you you have the most expensive mistake so far of all the people <laughs> I've I've done this with. The the next most expensive was a million. Yeah, that that's that's that that so, was mine though. It wasn't like a, a company's mistake or something. Mm. Well, I've never shared this publicly, but I'll I'll say it here because normally it's not something that you should think about, obviously. But 
uh, I made a decision to invest in my company Nerve. I, I invested six hundred and fifty thousand. I've said that before publicly. If I hadn't invested in Nerve, that six hundred and fifty thousand would today be worth about twenty million. With another decision I could have made instead, and that's in a five year period. So I think okay. I've probably won so far. <laughs> so I, 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 I have <laughs> another decision. <laughs> is um, before Anchor, I, I got an, uh, a really good offer from an early stage startup uh, to be uh, like a um, uh, co-CEO, president. And I turned it down. Um, the company is pre-IPO now and the valuation of, of, of that is yeah, it's in the $50 million range. Do you mean in terms of how much you would have had in terms of equity? Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. You won again. <laughs> I don't have but, anything bigger than than mine. But 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 let's see. I, I hope I made the right decision. Um, and at Anchor, we feel that we are uh, bringing a change. That people are open to that change, and customers want to work with the product and are happy with the product. If you look at LinkedIn and, and messages of uh, of new clients coming on board and seeing how it really changes the way they've done things until now and how much uh, impact and, and challenges it, it solves for them. How do you anticipate problems, not just with the, the people side of your businesses, but also the market? So like the internal and the external pressures. First of all, I don't anticipate all the, all the problems or probably most of the, of the problems uh, beforehand. I do uh, look at the market um, steadily and I do talk uh, with investors and entrepreneurs and, you know, check the, the, where the market is all the time. So I'll know what is happening in, in, in our industry. And, um, and you know, with all that's going on now, it's, it's, uh, it's a good question because nobody can really tell you um, if, the, you know, if we're going into a depression or, or it uh, will come back in, in January, everything will be okay. And um, once what we do uh, uh, do fast is react. So if we see that something is not working, then we start iterating around solutions and try new things um, and, um, and, and solve things uh, relatively quickly and, and uh, efficiently. How do you build the foundation of a company that allows you to make that kind of a test really quickly? Because everybody talks about you need to move fast. But how do you actually do that? Fast. So, so first of all, the company is in its culture looking how to improve. Um, it's how we manage um, our relationship with one another in the management, with the investors, um, with with the employees, the managers with their employees. Um, we try to improve from from day one. So the first. So in the interview, uh, one of the questions we ask is if. If you had a coach, what would you want to work with him on and what would you want to improve? And then when, if, if he starts working at the company, we actually go back to that and said, okay, let's, let's start doing it. Let's do one, one. Let's, there is a lot of methodologies to do that, but let's do your strength, your weaknesses. Let's see how you grow. Let's see how the company grows. Let's improve together. And the whole, the whole, uh, um, point here is is to grow in our journey um, as human beings as a company as a group um, so it's it's just you know so so it's just part of the language and how we see things and how we do things so once there is a, an issue and something is has a lot of friction everybody starts okay how do we solve this how let's let's improve let's move this to the right let's change the process let's it's it's um company-wide initiative. So does that come from you though? Are you like, okay, we need to make a change. I've seen this thing happening. Or like, is your marketing, you know, director or your, your CMO coming up with this? He's like, I guess I'm just trying to find out like, how does your organization know that something has to change? So, and, and how, how do you implement that change so quickly? So, so at, at the end of deeper than the culture side. At, at the end of the day, everything that happens in the company comes from from you or from the the founders or the high level management. It's, it depends on, on on the size. I'm a type of person that um, 
that sees problems and I want to solve everything. Uh, and I believe I can solve everything. So I, so I it's at least try. Um, and then you're the, um, you're the lighthouse. So if you act that way, then everyone else around you would act that way. And everybody around them would act that way. So if I see something on the floor, I'll pick it up and put it in the garbage. If something bugs me and how the door works, then I'll, I'll, I'll go and fix that. And then if someone sees that, he understands, okay, this is, this is what we're supposed to do. Like, this is how it works. We're trying to improve. That's why I said it's a company wide initiative. When I have, I have one-on-ones with all the team uh, once a quarter. And um, I come with a, an agenda and they come with an agenda. Most of the discussion is how we can get better. Um, what are the issues they see? How we can improve? Um, and, and it has its downsides because, um, because you're always around how you can improve and not you know, enjoying what you've done and how good you do, do things. So actually the, the, the uh, important thing here is to know how to balance that. And that's something I'm, I personally am still working on. Uh, also know, you know how to enjoy uh, success and how to enjoy the little things. And, um, and, and in our company, we still need to balance it better. And that's also at the end of the day for me. I've always wanted to move fast. And I've, I've learned from talking to other people who are running companies that sometimes moving fast is not the right decision. But I also see from my team that they act as a buffer against my ADD. (laughs) And they're like, look, we know you want to do this, but stop. Like, we just can't. We need to go and fix this other stuff first. This This is a good idea, but like maybe in six months we'll have the resources to handle it. So as much as I want to move fast, my team kind of doesn't let me move the company fast. I, I think it boils down to the definition of fast because they don't see them as slowing you down. They see them as we want to get from point A to point B. We can run around in circles and it'll take us a year to get here, but we can do it thoroughly, have less mistakes and actually get here in six months. And then the definition is in fast is just not, it's, it's not just moving fast because you can you know in a um in a marathon if you start the fastest possible you 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 won't finish so so and and we are also in in the company now working on defining what we want and improving the processes it's an ongoing process in every company probably always as a recommendation for you it's it's really you know listening and trying to understand what you are trying to achieve and how you are trying to achieve it and why you are trying to achieve it and, and, and then see the quickest way um, to do that. The quickest way sometimes takes three days to, to think about, but then you have an answer that takes two days and not a week. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said, where I think they see it as if they let me be in charge of like executing it, it'll take a year to do because sometimes I go, oh, shiny object. But if I give them a plan and they execute it and I kind of step back and leave them alone to do it, it might take six months only. I think that's what they, I think that's the way they feel about it because before I hired them all, it did take forever to get things done because I didn't know what I was doing. And then I hired them and they did know what they're doing. And then they're like, look, just give us the plan and we'll do it. And then I feel sometimes like I have nothing to do. I'm waiting for that moment to arrive. (laughs) Well, I know once we launch, then I'll be back in it, like talking to prospective customers and getting customer feedback and doing customer service. And so I, I know there's like a shit storm of stuff yeah. for me to do. Like, I know I'll be really busy for the next few years on, after we launch, but until we launch, I'm just kind of waiting around. Uh, so I'm curious how you have had to change yourself throughout the process of starting growing uh, and some and exiting some of these companies. I don't know if something is left from from the old run from 2011. Uh, everything everything changed. You know, uh, a lot of um, growing up and, and maturity and self control. Um, you know, breathing, listening, answering. There is a, when 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 you talk um, when you are a leader and, and you talk, every word counts and um, people can interpret it differently. So like we just said, fast, you say fast, you hear one thing, someone else can hear another thing. It happens all the time in, commu- in communication. It's actually the basis of um, 
it's 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 the basis of most of um challenges and struggles and wars and and whatever is it's just communication and um so so i've learned to control um to control myself to be mature to not allow you know that 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 feeling that ah, i'm mad at something so so i'm acting it out um oh yeah so um so a lot i'm um, working on that <laughs> So, so a lot of that and and you know as as I grow and I, and I see another angle and learn another industry, all that experience you know it it, it, it comes to to really knowing how to look at a problem and solve it in in a lot of different ways uh, if it's between people, if it's uh, someone that wants to grow, if it's in the product sales, you, you just gain so much experience um, that that you can give others and and uh, keep on improving. Last question I have for you: What advice would you give to anyone listening? What advice did I give last time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Um, so for today, um, if you're if you're a founder, um, the name of the game is grit. Um, if if uh, people know know exactly what it means, uh, it's this. Positive mindset, uh, resilience, persistence, uh, determination, and, and focusing on, on what you want to do. And um, my half second advice would be to define really, really well everything that you want to do your market, your product, every meeting, every goal, why you want to achieve it. Definitions are, you know, at the end of the day, you want to get from point A to point B. What's, what's point B? The better you define it, um, the more chances you have to, to reach it. Fantastic advice. Thank you, Rob. Perfect. Thank you, Sean.